I feel very honored uh, tonight and I also have come to the conclusion that President Obama is one of the wisest people I've ever heard of or ever met because when he appointed the, this young lady here, she is head. I, I mean, she just, <laughs> you'll see, she, she's just so impressive. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Nadine Gracia. She's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Minority Health, Health and Human services. Now in your program you see her biography so I'm just going to highlight on a few points. She's the Dep Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and the Director of the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of Minority Health is dedicated to improving the health of racial and ethnic, ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that will help to eliminate health disparities. Under Dr. Gracia's leadership, this office, she has overseen the implementation of an action plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities and the National Partnership for Action to End Health Disparities. She's a pediatrician by training, but she also had epidemiology training. She previously served as Chief Medical Office Officer for the Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. There, she provided policy and programmatic leadership for a portfolio that included child and adolescent health, climate change, disaster preparedness, and uh, we almost had a call her today, <laughs> the storm passed through here, <laughs> environmental health, global health, she was instrumental in the Haitian recovery and the White House Council on Women and Girls. She led the development of the environmental justice strategy for the department in 2012. She is a very brilliant young lady too. She's an honor graduate of Stanford University. She received a medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh and holds a Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology from the University of Pennsylvania. She completed postgraduate training at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, where she was the chief pediatric resident. Dr. Gracia is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She's a first generation Haitian American, and she's an advocate for minority and underserved populations and lectures nationwide on health disparities and health equity. She, had been, she has been named one of the Grills, Grills 100 history makers in the making. And according to BET, she was one of Washington's most powerful women. She's NASP, past president of the Student National Medical Association as well as the Postgraduate Physician Trustee for the National Medical Association. Ladies and gentlemen, I just touched on a few of the things, but she's a fantastic young lady, and as I said previously, she makes the president proud, and I see, I see why. Ladies and gentlemen. He needed to help in this work in health care, so I thank him for his constant support even now. You know, I am so humbled uh, to be here and to be able to speak to you as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and the Director of the Office of Minority Health because I stand before you as the daughter of immigrants to this country. My parents came to this country from Haiti where my mother was a school teacher and my father was a school principal. 
And they left Haiti not because they were fleeing political persecution or economic insecurity, but because they believed America to be a nation of opportunity unlike any other. And from them, I learned the values of sacrifice, and perseverance, hard work, and commitment to excellence. When they came to the US, my mother's first job was as a live-in nanny, and my father painted boats for $1.75 an hour. And they never told anyone, not their employers or their co-workers, about their former professions in Haiti, because they knew that their success and the success of their children would come from the quality of their work and not the position that they held. And being here tonight is such a particular honor because that perseverance, that resilience, and that sacrifice is so embodied in the history and the people of North Carolina. For me, this is an honor because as we gather here this evening, we are in the midst of an important commemoration and anniversary, that of the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, an historic law that forever transformed the landscape of this nation. And as I stand before you, I'm reminded of the great chapters that North Carolina contributed to this incredible story of the civil rights movement in this country. From the black ministers who boycotted the War Memorial Auditorium's opening in Greensboro in the 1930s to the young people in Lumberton who protested a lack of educational opportunities. To the North Carolina A&T University students who brought national attention through the Greensboro sit-in. And in the decade and domains of health and health care, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Medicare and Medicaid legislation in 1965 has been and continues to be such a powerful lever in our movement toward health equity. It is in part this story that has brought so much meaning to the time that we are in today and even in this month of April of National Minority Health Month. This month in which we raise awareness of the health disparities that continue to disproportionately affect racial and ethnic minorities and the work that remains before us to reduce those disparities and truly achieve health equity. Today, the images of inequality that cross our national consciousness perhaps are less shocking than the black and white images we think of from the era of segregation, from a time when separate but equal seemed as much as institution as we hold these truths to be self-evident. Today, the barriers to opportunity are perhaps less explicit, the lines of division perhaps less clear-cut, but in many ways the inequities remain just as searing because the disparities in health and health care remain and persist. A nation where minorities are less likely to get the preventive care needed to stay healthy, less likely to receive quality care when they get sick, and more likely to face poor health outcomes. Nationally, the statistics are still disturbing. Blacks are twice as likely to have diabetes than whites. Black men are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And while black women are 10% less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, excuse me, I said black men had uh, breast cancer. Black men, 60% more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. <laughs> I'm still a little lightheaded from uh, the turbulence coming down the plane. But while black women uh, are 10% less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, they're 40% more likely to die from it. And even from the beginning of life, we see that black infants are more than twice as likely to die in their first year of life than white infants. The trouble is that disparity exists here in North Carolina, as you all know, where blacks are 50% as likely to die of stroke than whites, where the rate of HIV among blacks who are 13 years or older is actually eight times that of whites and black youth who are under the age of 18 are 40% more likely to have asthma. It was these stark disparities that, that were highlighted in the landmark report in 1985, the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health, also known as the Heckler Report, that gave rise to the creation of the office that I have the honor to lead, the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And now, almost 30 years after that Heckler Report and the vast array of programs and policies that have been developed to improve the health of minority populations, an important note to draw is that these disparities do not just impact communities of color. They also exact a tremendous cost on our country as a whole. 
Whether we measure that in economic terms, where studies have shown that the cost of health disparities and premature death exceed a trillion dollars, or whether we talk about this in the context of the American promise of equality and opportunity. But I am here today because I truly believe that we have the opportunity to realize that American promise. Last year, I was at an event where I heard a historian say that history is not a steady stream of events, but rather it's like stones that are tossed into water, where you see these ripples. It's like punctuation points. And I truly believe that we are at the cusp of just such a punctuation point today. In re recent years, we have witnessed some hopeful trends in the reduction of disparities. For example, the gap in life expectancy between blacks and whites is, has been closing and it's at its narrowest that it's ever been since we actually started to record health, life expectancy. We're also making major gains when it comes to childhood immunization, which is so important because it's about prevention, preventing these diseases from happening in early life. And four years ago, when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law, it opened up an unprecedented window of opportunity in our movement toward health equity. Those of you that played a part in the passage of the law can speak to the journey that it took for us to get here. From the doubts and the debates about aiming too high and thinking too big, to the naysayers who doubted that it would withstand the challenges that came its way. I'm sure you can count how many times have we tried to repeal, has it been tried to be repealed, the health care law and to take hold as it was intended to be. As the implementation of the Affordable Care Act unfolds, we can truly step back and recognize all that it represents. It is, in the words of our U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, not just another law. It's the culmination of decades of work that sometimes some of us only see once or twice in our lifetimes. And it is already making a difference. We all heard the news when President Obama announced just last week that eight million Americans have gained access to coverage through the health insurance marketplace. Eight million. But one thing I must do is to thank all of you, to thank you for your support, to thank you for your tireless efforts to get the word out and educate communities about the Affordable Care Act and to help people actually enroll for coverage. Because the eight million people who have enrolled is a true testament of the power of what we can achieve when we actually work together. The healthcare law tackles so many of the factors that have long been associated with health disparities. Lack of health insurance. Lack of health insurance is one of the most significant barriers to health care and is one of the most significant contributors to health disparities that we see. And perhaps more than any other demographic or economic factor, it also influences the timeliness and quality of care that people receive. And while minorities make up one third of the population, they make up more than half of those who are uninsured. But because of the health care law, millions of uninsured and underinsured Americans, including many minority populations, are now having access for coverage that they never had before. Thanks to the law, it's ending discrimination that insurance companies could actually prevent people from getting access to coverage because they may have had, for example, a pre-existing condition like asthma or diabetes. Conditions that we know disproportionately impact minority communities. And now because of the law, that is illegal. It's making a difference. It's making a difference for the four, more than four million people here in North Carolina who have pre-existing conditions or enabling young adults to be able to stay on their parents' health insurance plans until the age of 26. Already more than three million young adults have been able to get access health coverage because of that provision of the law, and many of them are young adults of color. Last year I had the opportunity to participate in a town hall meeting with one of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, where we were educating the community about the benefits of the health care law, and there was a woman who stood up and said, I would just like to read a letter from my daughter. She stood up and started to read this letter in which her daughter said that she had started college. Shortly after starting college, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which can be a, a debilitating disease. And she was devastated. The daughter, she was a dancer, very active, had all of these career goals and dreams, and she thought, is this the end for me? 
But because of the law, she was able to access health coverage and be able to stay on her parents' plan until she turned 26. And she wrote, she was so excited that the health insurance marketplace was coming into being because she didn't have to fear that because she had a pre-existing condition, she wouldn't be able to access health insurance coverage and have the security and peace of mind of knowing that she would have care when she needed it the most. And so she wrote, I just want to thank you, President Obama, because the health care law is saving my life. That is what this law is all about. There are investments that we are making in preventive care, millions of people who are now accessing the preventive services that many could not afford before the health care law. Many who had to make the difficult choice of whether to pay their grocery bills, pay their electricity bills, or go and get that cancer screening, get the diabetes screening. Now, because of the health care law, recommended preventive services are covered at no cost, no co-pays, no deductible. 71 million Americans across the country who are gaining access to those preventive services, more than 2 million here in North Carolina. But we know it wasn't just about having an insurance card. We know it's also about getting access to care and quality care. And what the law is also doing is ensuring that we improve the access to care for millions of people across the country. Investing, for example, in community health centers, which are such an important safety net in the community, providing services for some of the most vulnerable and underserved communities. Where nearly two out of three patients that are actually served at community health centers are minorities. One in five are African American. Providing care that is greatly needed to those who need it most. And what we often forget, too, is that these community health centers are also economic engines in their communities. Because of these investments in, of, in these community health centers, more than 35,000 jobs have been created. Health center grantees, even here in the state of North Carolina, have gotten over $96 million to support ongoing operations to establish new health center sites and expand services. But we also have to have a workforce that can meet the needs of our increasingly diverse population. We need to ensure that those who are providing care for our diverse population have the cultural competency to be able to provide high quality care. And so the law certainly is investing in our nation's future workforce. One of the investments has been through the Na National Health Service Corps, an innovative program to encourage students to go into primary care in exchange for repaying their educational loans. We know that debt has a significant influence on the choices that people can make. And because of these investments in the National Health Service Corps and other investments in other laws, we've actually been able to see an increase in the number of the Corps, nearly doubling since 2008. But why this is another important issue, in particular for communities of color, is that we see a growing diversity among the National Health Service Corps where African Americans, for example, represent approximately 6% of the national physician workforce. They represent 17% of the national health physician workforce. And why that is important is it shows the commitment of minority physicians to practicing in communities of color and the underserved communities and bringing that high quality care. So these investments are certainly making an important stride as we move forward in ensuring that we have a workforce that can respond to the needs of our communities. We also know people have debated whether or not, or not the law was going to uh, cause us to lose jobs. And what we have seen is actually that since the Affordable Care Act passed into law, the private sector has added 8.1 million jobs. Now we can contrast that to what happened in the decade before the Affordable Care Act, in which the private sector actually lost 3.8 million jobs. 8.1 million gained versus 3.8 million gained, million lost. This is the story that is often not being told. This is the story that we have to tell so that communities understand the importance of this law, why it is so critical, and why it will make such a tremendous difference. And I know that an important part of this health care law and, and has been a discussion of this summit has been the expansion of Medicaid. And now I know that North Carolina has not expanded Medicaid. But it is worth repeating, as the daughter of former educators, they say repetition, repetition, repetition. 
It is worth repeating that there is no deadline for states to expand. And we will continue to work with states as they work to come on board. We will continue to work with states to understand the benefits of expanding Medicaid because it's not just about helping people gain access to coverage, it's a good deal for the states. Coverage for newly eligible adults is fully covered, fully federally paid for the first three years. And beyond that, it doesn't go below 90%. So expanding coverage is important when we talk about controlling health care costs, whether it's hospitals that are facing uncompensated care, businesses that now have to take over some of the costs because there are people who are uninsured and they have to as assume those costs, and it's also strengthening local economies. What we also know for the African American community is that for eligible uninsured African Americans, six in 10 could receive tax credits in the marketplace, be eligible for Medicaid or CHIP, the Chil Children's Health Insurance Plan. If all states were to expand Medicaid, it would be 95% of eligible African Americans, uninsured African Americans who would get those tax credits, be eligible for Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program. We have work yet to do. From opening doors to coverage to strengthening access to investing in our nation's health workforce, the health care law is one of the most powerful and important pieces of legislation that will help to reduce health disparities in this nation. But we recognize that it is not enough to initiate a transformation. There has to be perseverance. There has to be commitment to this work. Under the leadership of our secretary, we've released the first ever action plan to redu release reducing health disparities in racial and ethnic minorities. Because we know that it is all of us working together that will achieve this goal. So as the implementation of the Affordable Care Act continues, our charge is to press ahead, to keep the momentum going, to ensuring that everybody has the opportunity to live a healthy life. Because as we know, even for those who have now gained access to coverage, we have to ensure that they actually understand what that coverage means, how to be able to access care, and that the quality of care that they receive respects their cultural beliefs, their communications needs, and the communities that they're from. President Obama once said that it's not enough to look back in wonder of how far we've come. I want us to look ahead with a fierce urgency at how far we have left to go. As we look ahead to this road toward health equity and this time of incredible transformation of healthcare, that sense of urgency has never before been more evident. Many tell me or ask me, is this the time for us to be engaged? I've been in the fight for so long. We've been working to eliminate health disparities and achieve health equity for so long. They say, why are you still in, in this fight? And I tell them because our communities are depending on us. They need us. And we are blessed to be in the positions that we are in to be able to serve on their behalf and ensure that their voices are heard at the table. You know, health equity is in the spotlight and on our national agenda as it has never been before. And with that comes an unprecedented opportunity. I certainly commend you for your work and I thank you for the dedication that you have had over the many years to helping people, the people of North Carolina have the greatest of opportunity. I think that now it is time for us to rededicate ourselves, continue in this work. Because 50 years from now, as we celebrate and commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act this year, 50 years from now, we want to be able to say that history will look back on us and see that we saw an unprecedented opportunity for change, that we rose to the occasion to meet it. We seized that opportunity and that we made the most of it. We began this evening with the, national, the Negro National Anthem, and I think how it closes is very powerful and certainly a lesson to us all. It closes where we close, that we would march on till victory was won. So let us journey together toward a nation that is free of disparities in health and health care, a nation where everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy life because our communities are depending on it and our nation is depending on it. Thank you very much.